Hey everybody, what is up? It's Thanksgiving week. Happy Thanksgiving. I love Thanksgiving. It's going to be so fun. I love to eat a ton of food. You heard me. Not a little bit, a lot. I love Thanksgiving week, but I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what will change your life as a Christian. People a lot of times are looking for something like, what can I do to, to, to you know, get uh, more passionate about Jesus? It's going to change my life. I will tell you a secret. I'll tell you a secret. Become a person of incredible gratitude towards the Lord. I'm telling you, I used to not love to pray. Can I admit that to you guys? Can I admit it? I used to not love to pray. I'm still not Mr. Prayer Warrior. I am getting better, all right? So I'm admitting something to you. It's a little bit embarrassing. Let me ask you this. Have you ever gotten bored when you were praying? I'm just saying, have that ever happened? It happened to me all the time. I, I was just like, I don't really know. I just don't know what to say. I've got nothing else to say to God. I mean, I'm, I'm happy. I'm thankful. I don't really know. You know what, you, you, what changed my life and what you could do? When you're praying and you don't have anything to say, just begin to thank God. I know it sounds silly, trite, basic, but the truth is most of the great things in, in your life, most of the spiritual principles are all basic principles that we just forget, right? It's the same with any discipline in your life. So do this. When you're praying and you don't know what to say, just thank God. Just say, I'm, I'm so thankful that I am saved. Thank you for the cross. I could never have earned it. Thank you for my wife. Thank you for my kids. Thank you for my house. And all of a sudden, you will become a person of great thankfulness. Then you'll be ready for whatever happens, uh, whatever you're faced with in the world. Those challenges come. You will be facing them from a place of thankfulness to God because he's given you so many blessings that you did not deserve. All right? So I'm just telling you, that will change your life. That's part of why I love Thanksgiving. It is a reminder every year that we need to be people of incredible, uh, um, you know, gratitude. And uh, that is an awesome thing to express to the Lord, all right? He will change your life in prayer in that. So I want you to think about that and do it. Now, speaking of being thankful in this country, we have such incredible blessing. Most of us are like, you know what? I'm going to have a turkey on Thanksgiving. That comes from the Lord. Thank him for that. A lot of us are so blessed that we get to put a little bit of money away for our kids, maybe colleges, for our futures, and maybe there's retirement plans at the place you work. I don't know what your situation is. But speaking of that, let me take this quick opportunity to say, you may want to do what I did, which is put a little bit of your money, your IRA or whatever it is that you do for the future, for, for investments, put a little bit of money into precious metals, into gold and silver. And you know I do all of that through my friends at SD Bullion. All right, SD Bullion. They're a Christian company. They have awesome products. They have great prices. They ship it straight to your door. All you got to do is this. Text the word Cooper to 465 465- 322. That spells gold 22 because we keep it real. And they're going to send you something for free, just information. It teaches you um, about what diversifying your funds is, why it's a good idea to diversify into precious metal, um, especially in a time when we are printing money like Cray. All right. We've all seen inflation. That's going to affect your IRA funds and all those kind of things. They'll send you something for free unless you go, dude, I already know I want to spend 50, 60 bucks. Maybe you want to buy a little silver coin for your husband or for your grandkids, whatever it is. You can spend 50 or 60 bucks, all right, and get some sweet silver coins, all right? You know what I'm saying? Or some gold, the taste of it, the smell of it. I love gold. It's pretty cool. Text the word Cooper to 465322. Get started with SD Bullion today. They'll give you a discount on your first one if you're just now starting. Now it's time for me to shut up and talk about a sweet episode on what Thanksgiving even is. I think you guys are going to dig this. Let's jump in to Cooper stuff. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Cooper Stuff. We have a cool, really cool edition today. And I don't even know what all we're going to talk about, but we're definitely going to get to some Thanksgiving type stuff. But it's going to probably be even a lot more than that. I want to introduce to you my guest today. His name is Tim Barton, and he is with Wall Builders, and they're doing all sorts of stuff. I think the best way to do this would just be to let Tim talk and kind of say who he is and what exactly it is that he does before we jump into all this. 
Uh, well, John, first of all, man, thanks for having me on. It's great to be with you. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, so, yeah, I, I run an organization called Wall Builders, and we do a lot with American history. And, and with American history, we do a lot of work with uh, state legislators on public policy. We do a lot of work with pastors and Christians and churches. Uh, we do work in education. But, but ultimately, the work we do with American history has led us to collect original documents from early American history. We have what's considered the largest private collection of original documents from the founding era. So we have actual letters and writings from George Washington and, and John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Hancock, or any founding father you can name. We pretty much have writings from them. And what we've tried to do is, especially in the modern narrative, there's a lot of stories being told about America that, that simply just aren't historically accurate. And so often these stories are being told in a very negative slant to belittle America or the founding fathers or say how America was so awful or bad and evil. And even though America wasn't a perfect nation and no nation's ever been perfect because every nation is full of sinners who need a savior. So that's a given. The America's not perfect, but America's not guilty of most of the crimes she's accused of today. And what we try to do is just go people, take people back, walk them back to show them original documents, say, let's, let's go back and let's see what they actually wrote, what they actually said, what they actually did. Most people know very little about American history, very little about the founding fathers, and certainly know even less about their Christian faith or the Christian heritage of the nation. And that's a lot of what we try to represent to people using the original documents from those individuals themselves. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, I, I definitely, I, I, my ADD is going to kick in. I'm going to be all over the place, man. I'm sorry, but but you just said something that I got to stop for a second. So, you know, one of the things that I always hear, or let me ask you, let me ask it this way. Here, here's a better way to say it. I definitely pick up on the fact, even within a lot of Christian circles today, a lot of growing Christian circles, I would say, unless I'm crazy. It's almost, I don't think they like it very much when we say good things about America. And mm -hmm. I and it's kind of framed almost like you're being idolatrous uh, yeah. by liking your own country or w w what's that all about? What's the deal, man? So I, I think there's a couple a couple explanations, a couple of reasons for this. Um, if you look at, at big picture, kind of the founding fathers for nearly 60 years, they've been villainized in academic circles. If you go back to the 60s and 70s, there were accusations. The founding fathers were all sexually immoral people. They were all having illegitimate children. They were having these affairs. Well, when you get to the 80s and 90s, the accusations surrounding the founding fathers were they weren't religious people or they were atheists. They were agnostics. They were deists. They wanted a separation of church and state. They wanted a secular America. When you get to the 2000s, the 2010s, kind of in our present era, the accusations are that they were all these racist, bigoted slaveholders. Now, in all these accusations, the vast majority of these accusations are so incredibly inaccurate, but because we don't know actually who the founding fathers are, we don't recognize this. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up is that why, why would we want to villainize the founding fathers for the last 60 years? Well, it, it's not just because people are saying, hey, let's go back and actually learn who they are and, and what their lives were like. The reason intentionally that in academic circles, people have tried to villainize the founding fathers is as, as we have seen a growing movement in America where people are embracing socialism or, or communism or Marxism, that doesn't work under the U.S. Constitution. But in, in modern era, in the last couple of years, especially the last decade or so, people are beginning to think, well, you know, the Constitution that's a pretty racist document or the declaration. That's a racist document. We are now thinking negative thoughts about the constitution or about the declaration. And the reason is, is if, if the founding fathers were all evil, then what they did must have been evil. And therefore we shouldn't have the constitution or declaration. So there's been a very intentional move to villainize the founding fathers so that we could remove the constitution. And that way we can then embrace socialism or communism, or Marxism, because you can't really do that under the current constitution because we have the bill of rights and the bill of rights is contradictory to these notions of socialism or Marxism or communism. Now, the, the reason again, kind of, I'm going round the mountain a little bit to answer your question question. But for Christians, as Christians are beginning to say, wait a second, no, this is crazy. We we need to defend this. There's a lot of people saying, no, wait a second, Christians, you need to stay in your lane. And your lane is Jesus only. So it goes back to kind of a, a pretty poor worldview that a lot of Christians have is that in churches, we should only talk about Jesus and don't talk about anything else. And even though I love Jesus, and I would love to talk about Jesus all the time, Jesus told his disciples, 
He said, when, when you go from this place, he said, all authority has been given to me. He says, therefore, go and make disciples, teaching them everything I've commanded you. Well, if you're making disciples and you're teaching them everything Jesus commanded, that's more than just telling people about Jesus. That, that, that's now getting into a lot more of theology and doctrine. And, and part of theology and doctrine used to be understanding that we are salt and light. And salt and light it impacts culture. It gets involved in culture. You can even back up to in Jeremiah. I think it's a great example. In Jeremiah 29, 11, a verse a lot of people know where Jeremiah reminds the Israelites, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope in the future. Well, that's in verse 11. If you stay in the same chapter and back up just a couple of verses, Jeremiah, it, it, it's very clear. Jeremiah is writing to the Israelites who are enslaved in the Babylonian captivity. So he's writing to people who are literally in slavery in this moment. And he tells them, guys, just because you're in bondage, he says, don't stop getting married. Don't stop having kids. He said, and where you are living, you need to seek the peace and the prosperity of the land in which you live. For when it goes well with that land, it will go well with you. Now, he's literally telling people enslaved that where you are, you need to seek the best for the place where you are. Well, this would be true whether we lived in Germany or Japan or South Korea or South Africa. The nation doesn't matter. The reality is as Christians, we should work to make the place we live better. We should get involved in culture. We should promote righteousness and godliness in that culture. And there's been a major disconnect in modern America where people think if we are promoting godliness and culture, then we are making culture. We're making America an idol. And there probably are people that have made America an idol, just like there's people that have made all kinds of things an idol in their life. Well, that's incorrect. But the notion as Christians that maybe we shouldn't care about America or we shouldn't be engaged, that's that's a basic misunderstanding in my mind of even this call to be salt and light in culture and what that looks like. So I think part of this is a, a worldview and conflict problem. And part of it also, when leading up even to this midterm election, there was a lot of accusations of for Christians who are promoting things in America, they're Christian nationalists, and people are putting labels on Christians engaging in culture in a way to try to silence them and make them back down, which is a, a tactic that's been used across nations for literally thousands of years, you want to demonize people who are doing something you don't like to try to make them stop, right? To try to make them think, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. But the reality is that getting involved in culture is not a contrary idea to scripture. It's actually a fulfillment of the ideas of scripture, even the fulfillment of this notion of the Great Commission. It's part of how we make disciples. It's part of how we impact culture with righteousness and godliness. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Very interesting. You know, I had not considered, um, I was actually thinking of the Christian nationalism thing before you even brought it up because I had not considered how you said that there are, uh, in the nineties or in the two thousands and that there's a different kind of attack. And mm -hmm. I'm definitely, I'm definitely under the, the, uh, feeling it sounds like exactly what you just said that really what's happening is that, that the culture wants to dethrone Christ from any cultural influence, mm -hmm. you know, this is a country that obviously has a lot of influence from Christianity and our, in our laws and in our morals and things like that. And if, if that's what has to go, then we have to attack the founding of America. But I had not considered that, that they take different approaches in different eras. It's almost like a, uh, uh, you know, a, a battle strategy, isn't it? You, you attack on many different fronts all at once. And I've I've seen that happen only in the last uh, two years with the Christian nationalism. The Christian nationalism is just the newest version of one of the old things. It's like a, a new name. But that was very interesting. I wouldn't mind you. I wouldn't mind you um, telling me one of the biggest ones that I grew up with was this idea that the founders were not actually Christians. That most of them were actually agnostic. Um, I wouldn't mind you kind of talking about that for a second. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, and, and this is, I mean, this is a very common thing because, I mean, this is what was taught in the schools literally for decades, but one of the problems with this, right? So if we look back to the founding fathers, there were 56 individuals that signed the declaration. Now I'm not going to put you on the spot, but if we talk about there's 56 guys that signed the declaration, if, if we ask any American, Okay. And, and again, I won't put you on the spot, but we could play this game. If I said, can you name five signers of the declaration? And just also to help you out, 
George Washington didn't sign the declaration because he was commander of the military. Alexander Hamilton was in the military, didn't sign the declaration. James Madison in the military didn't sign the declaration. So let me just take away a couple of big names we already know. Well, well most people, there's like the, even the famous painting of the signers of the declaration. And if you look at that famous painting, and really it was it was known as the presentation of the declaration, but it's kind of known as the signers of the declaration. If you look in that famous painting, there's more than 40 founding fathers there. And, and all of them, it's like a portrait. So you actually can look and go, oh, that's who this is. Well, if you look at that portrait, people often can find Thomas Jefferson. They often find Benjamin Franklin. And sometimes people find John Adams. And that's all they find in the portrait. Well, well, that's mm. three of 56 signers of the Declaration. We, we can't even name five guys that signed the Declaration. But here's the point. How do we know that all of them were atheists, agnostics, or deists when we don't even know who they were? This is where I right. want to start. Right? Because... The reality is if we just begin learning some of who they were, for example, we have guys like John Witherspoon. John Witherspoon was a not only a sign of the declaration, he was a pastor from Scotland. He was recruited to come to America by two other founding fathers who signed the declaration, James Wilson and Benjamin Rush. Well, he was recruited to come be the president of Princeton because at that time in early America, every single university, the president was a pastor and usually it was a pastor of the denomination that the university was. So he was recruited to come to America to be a pastor. Well, not only was he a pastor in charge of Princeton University, they had a church that he pastored at Princeton. He has, all, I mean, hundreds of sermons that he has written and printed, but in New Jersey where Princeton is, he noticed when he got to America that there was families in New Jersey that didn't have their own Bibles. He was responsible in the 1790s. There was a what was considered a family Bible that came out in New Jersey, and it was done so that every family in New Jersey could have their own Bible. And it was called a family Bible. It was large enough that a family could sit at a dinner table and they could go through the Bible together. Well, the reason, again, this matters. This is a guy that in, in the actual painting of the Declaration, this guy is wearing his clerical collar in the, the portrait, in the painting. So like you can actually look and go, oh, that guy, he's wearing something different. Yes, that's his clerical collar. He was painted with his pastoral collar on in the signing of the declaration. Well, that's just one. I can go through a whole lot because of the 56 signers of the declaration, 29 of them graduated from Bible colleges and seminaries. Hmm. Wow. Well, that, that's not the normal activity of atheists, agnostics, and deists to go to Bible college or seminary. And, and here's where I'll go even further. Of the 56 signers of the Declaration, only one of them, one, in their entire life ever self-ascribed to be a deist, one. Now, none of them ever claimed to be an atheist or agnostic. Uh, pretty much all of them professed to be Christian, but only one of them ever claimed to be a deist. Well, that was Benjamin Franklin. And it was actually in his autobiography, which we actually own, his original autobiography, one of those first printings. And in this early autobiography, if you, which is also available online, so if people want to go search for it, they can. And if you look for the word deist, what you will find is in his autobiography, he says when he was 15 years old, he was listening to some people speak. And, and actually, there were several famous deists who were in town, and, and he listened to their arguments. And then there were several pastors who began giving the rebuttal to these arguments of the deists. He said, and I listened to both sides. And he said, he was 15 years old. He said, it occurred to me that the deists we're making some really strong claims that these pastors weren't able to rebut. He says, so I decided that maybe I would become a deist. And then the next sentence, he says, but I soon realized that although some of the arguments of the deists might be correct, that deism as a whole was not going to be useful for me in my life, and it would be of no benefit to others in their life. So I quickly left this belief behind. Now, that's the only founding father who ever self-identified as a deist. And it was when, by his own admission, he was 15 years old. He says he thought about it, quickly left it behind. So, so what does that mean? He was a deist for like a week and a half? This is, this is the only guy who ever ascribed to that. And actually, if you go and read some of Franklin's writings, it's amazing how much Franklin himself acknowledges his belief in the Bible, his belief in God, that, that there's a God who answers prayers and, and he rewards the good, he punishes the wicked, that there is an afterlife. Like this is the least religious founding father, Franklin, who uh, I, I would th argue and acknowledge, I, I don't think he was a Christian. And, and there's a couple of reasons for that. There's a couple of letters we'll point to where at, at the very end of his life, uh, Franklin was writing to the president of Yale University, who was Ezra Stiles, who was also a pastor. And Ezra Stiles had written Franklin and asked him, hey, 
I, I don't mean any disrespect. And, and this was the very end of Franklin's life. Uh, this was three months before Franklin died is when he got this letter. And Ezra Stiles said, I don't mean any disrespect. I'm just curious, where do you stand on the position of, of Jesus? Do you believe he was a son of God? Do you, do you believe he's a savior of the world? He said, I mean, no disrespect. Uh, Ezra Stiles told him, he said, I wish everybody were like me, except for all my faults. But when it comes to my relationship with Jesus, I, I love Jesus so much. And the relationship we have, I wish everybody could enjoy what I enjoyed. And I'm just curious, what do you think about Jesus? Well, Franklin wrote him a letter back and, and he said, I, I don't take any disrespect from your question. It's a good question. He says, and it's a question that really requires much examination, and I haven't given it that examination. So I don't know if Jesus was merely a good teacher or if he truly was the son of God. We know he gave us the best moral code that anybody could follow and live by, he says. But at my age, I'm sure I will soon discover if Jesus truly is the son of God or if he was just a good prophet. He says, but please don't tell anybody that, that I have any questions about Jesus. He said, I, I've lived my entire life to be on, on a good relationship with other Christians. And, and he said, in fact, as a printer, I've printed all their sermons. I've printed their religious pamphlets. I, I, I've tried so hard to be friends with everybody. I, I wouldn't want them to think less of me because I'm not sure about Jesus. Well, what we also know is it's very possible in that month and a half before he died, the Holy Spirit was like, hey, study Jesus, right? Like, go see, was he truly the son of God? It's totally possible. Franklin, in that last month and a half, did an investigation, discovers Jesus, gets saved. Well, I mean, totally possible we could see Franklin in heaven. That would be super cool. But even with this, like in the letter he writes to Ezra Stiles, he, he doesn't say that I, I reject Christianity, I reject Jesus. He says, I'm just not sure if he's truly divine. Now, I kind of wish he had read Josh McDowell's book, More Than a Carpenter, because I think he does a great <laughs> job going through that. You know, C.S. Lewis and Mere Christianity also kind of unfolds the idea that it's 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 either Lord, liar, or lunatic. You, you can't be just a good teacher claiming what he did. Nonetheless, the point is, like, even in Franklin's own writings, Franklin was not anti-religious. He just maybe wasn't a Christian, but that's very different than what a lot of the accusations we hear today, where we hear, oh, no, those founding fathers, they weren't Christians. They didn't believe in God. They didn't believe in Jesus. That's wholly incorrect. In fact, you will be very hard pressed to find any founding father who did not believe in God and who didn't believe that Jesus and his teachings were the best moral code and moral system, but the vast majority of founding fathers actually were Christians. And a, a guy you can appreciate, uh, Francis Hopkinson, was a, another sign of the declaration. He was from Pennsylvania. Before he signed the declaration, he was the, the music minister. He was the organist. He led the choir at Christ Chapel in Philadelphia. One of the projects he did, we actually have behind me, I, I have a hymn book. And it was the first hymn book to have musical notations in America. Because before there would be a cantor in a church and they would sing a couple lines and then the, the congregation would repeat those lines in whatever tone or, or you know whatever kind of melody that the, the cantor had led. Well, what is interesting is, is he puts the very first music to hymns in America. Well, his hymn book was called the Psalms of David. He took the 150 psalms and he set the 150 psalms to music so that his church could sing the psalms like David had sung the psalms. And, and, I, and I know you as someone who knows the Bible. I mean, first of all, 150 psalms is a lot to put to music, but Psalm 119, that is a <laughs> massive psalm yeah. to put to music. In his hymn book, it was 32 pages, which is oh, also wow. a massive hymn. But 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 this is a guy, again, like if we actually knew who these guys were, if we actually studied their lives, okay, so the guy who's the organist, who's the hymn leader at his church, and during the revolution, he actually was a chaplain in the military in the revolution, we, we would not be confused that this guy was in fact a Christian, but most people have never even heard of who Francis Hopkinson was, or the guy we mentioned earlier, a John Witherspoon. I could go down a list of all the founding fathers, and we could tell stories and this is the reality. If we if we knew the truth, we wouldn't believe a lie. But so often in lies, we just give a overgeneralized statement and we don't give examples or we don't go through enough examples to realize that a lot of the claims being made just are are completely inaccurate. And because we don't know the truth, we buy into this lie. And, and that's a lot of what we try to do at Wall Builders is go back and reintroduce people to some of the actual history of America, to who these founding fathers were, the influence of Christianity, the influence of the Bible. And, and what made America such a special nation? It was doing things God's way because God's ways work. And in modern culture, the more we have secularized the nation, this goes back to kind of where we were earlier in the conversation, 
when, when we are seeing people promote socialism and Marxism, communism, the very fundamental of, of communism or Marxism is you need a secular nation. And the reason you need a secular nation is because government takes the place of God. And, and in a nation, there are only two options. You either have a really big God or you have a really big government. You don't have both. In America, when we believed in a really big God, we knew that, well, it's my God that shall supply all my needs according right, to his riches in Christ Jesus. We, we're not needing the government to solve all our problems because there's a God. We don't need government to give us rights because we have God-given rights. But the more we reject God in America, the more secular we become, the bigger government gets. And, and that's what happens in nations that move to Marxism, communism, socialism. They secularize their nation, they remove God, and then they make government the new God of that nation. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Uh, totally right. I mean, you know, one of the things I think that the world has done, I would say the, the, the secularists have done a really, really good job. On, <laughs> let's, let's give credit where credit is due. They've done a pretty good job on this because yeah, I think we as the church um, are, you know, us as parents, a lot of us as parents, we've really messed this up. The secularists did a good job, I think, by telling these these stories. They had these attack strategies, as you say. The strategies don't hold a lot of weight, but but one of the reasons they don't hold a lot of weight is because even if they did, let's just say, even if they do convince people that the founding fathers were not Christians, none of them were Christians, right? Even so, for the fact that there's so much proof that they believed in the, in um, either A, as you just said, that the moral code of the Bible is the best way to live. You know, so so there. I've heard a uh, a few years ago. I remember Jordan Peterson. I know some people say Jordan Peterson may have may have gotten born again. I don't I don't know whether that's true or not. All right, but five six years ago, some of the things he said led me to think what he was getting at was, I'm not sure if Jesus is actually God, but we need to live our lives as if he is because there's no there's no more. Uh, prove there's no better way to live than what the Bible mm. says, and I think that one of the one of the reasons the seculars why it worked was because we didn't teach. Hey, even if uh, not all the founding fathers were Christians or not, that doesn't mean that 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 they they built something incorrectly if they acknowledge that the created order of the Bible yeah. is right. So you can you can reject Jesus Christ as Lord, but not reject the world that he created meaning that the things that you see with your eyes and and hear with your ears actually are real right now what we're seeing is a rejection of god not just christ as lord but a rejection of god's created order and it's led to what we have now uh, uh, that just leads you to madness uh, to moral yeah. madness and we lead to men can become pregnant and all sorts of things because they haven't just re rejected christ as lord Lord, they rejected the entire worldview. And I think that I just think that we parents, we need to do a better job of training our kids to understand that that, that knowing the Bible is not just so that we know Christ after we die. It's that we see Christ implemented in our lives right here on earth, and that we are we are becoming more sanctified and more sanctified, leading up to when we do die, in which our final, what do you call it, final uh, sanctification or whatever that word is called. Um, so I think that was a great point that you made. Maybe I want to ask you this. Let's talk about Thanksgiving because it's gonna. it has something to do with what we're talking about. I almost feel like a lot of Christians now say, well, I am celebrating Thanksgiving, but only because I'm, I'm thankful to the Lord, completely separated from yeah. – I mean, I think that's an ultimate thing. Yes, you should be thankful to Jesus this Thanksgiving. That's your, that's that's what it's all about. But there is an aspect of this that we are thankful to live in a country where I'm not persecuted for going to church. I'm not yeah. persecuted for doing this podcast with you and saying Jesus Christ is Lord. They're not going to come in and take my kids away. I'm kind of thankful for that. What is Thanksgiving? <laughs> yeah. What is it, Tim? So, yeah, let, let, let's back up, right? So, I mean, the reality is people giving thanks to God, we can go all the way back to Bible times, right? I mean, really, this is a this is a, a very common thing. Anytime God did something, we always should turn around and say thank you for what God has done. When, when Jesus healed the 10 lepers and only one came back to say thank you, and Jesus is like, where's everybody else, right? Weren't, weren't there more people healed? It, it's because there's a responsibility we have to be grateful to God, recognizing the, the blessings and benefits we have in our life. And that tradition in America, as, as we come up to Thanksgiving in 2022, 
this is the 401st Thanksgiving celebrated in America since the Pilgrims' first Thanksgiving. So this is a, a big deal. We have an incredibly long tradition and legacy. And, and part of this actually does go back to understanding the Pilgrims, to understand how big of a deal this really was, what they started and celebrated in America. Uh, the, the, the Pilgrims were a church congregation in England. And in England, as you're coming into the, the late 1500s, early 1600s, the Reformation is in full effect. And for those listening that maybe aren't familiar with the Reformation, this is when it's known as a Protestant Reformation, but, but really it, it was Catholic priests and monks who were protesting the unbiblical things that were happening under the state established church. And so they were protesting saying, Hey, let's go back and do what the Bible says, right? Where Martin Luther with his 95 thesis that goes in the door of the church in Wittenberg, one of the things that is really worth noting is he was c protesting, complaining about the fact that we're saying in order for people to have forgiveness of sins, they have to pay a priest for that priest to pay for or pray for them so they can be forgiven of sins. Like you don't pay somebody money to have sins forgiven. That is crazy. Well, certainly for people that know the Bible and have read the Bible, we'd go, yeah, that's crazy. That's not how that works. But in the dark ages, when the Bible was largely only read in Latin, and most people didn't speak Latin, they certainly didn't read Latin, you might find the Greek Septuagint, the, the, the Bible in Greek, and, and even fewer people were familiar with Greek or go back to the Hebrew Old Testament. They didn't speak Hebrew and Greek and Latin. And this is part of the push that led to even the, the, the Bible being translated. One of the early Bibles that was translated is the Geneva Bible. This is a 1590 Geneva Bible. And what's really cool about this Bible is it actually came to America with one of the Puritan families. In the front of this Bible, it actually has their family genealogy written in quill pen, which oh, is wow. really kind of fun. Well, the Geneva Bible, these are the Bibles that were done in Geneva, Switzerland. And what made the Geneva Bible so unique is this is the first Bible mass produced in English. And in the side margin, it's filled with commentaries. And the reason was that for so many people, they're getting the Bible for the very first time. And if you're reading through the Bible and you're going through the prophets, you're in Leviticus or Numbers, right? You're somewhere and you're like, I don't understand what I'm reading right now. This makes no sense. Well, in the Geneva Bible, they took commentary from early reformers and they put that commentary in the Geneva Bible. Well, part of the things the the reformers were explaining was a lot of the practices under the kings, whether it be the king of Spain or France, or if you're looking in Germany or England, wherever it is, the practices under these state established churches are not what the Bible actually taught. And it actually led to the Geneva Bible being banned, specifically England. We'll talk about there first. The Geneva Bible was banned in England because in the commentary, some of the things the reformers point out was a king was never God's idea. God, God didn't want kings. And if you remember first Samuel, when the Israelites say we want a king and Samuel says, that's a terrible idea, right? The, the king right. is going to tax you and take your sons, your daughters, your property, your livestock. You don't want a king. Well, the reformers point out in this commentary that a king was never God's idea. And they start going through very practical cultural issues, explaining when you read this verse, this is what it's talking about. This is how it applies to culture. And so the king, again, as you can imagine, the king was very displeased. In fact, in England, the guy that banned the Geneva Bible was King James. If King James sounds familiar, it should, because King James came up with an alternative solution. He came out in 1611 with a King James Bible. We have, this is a 1612 King James Bible. This is a second year printing of the King James Bible. So really remarkable when you talk about old Bibles, what is also, I mean, and, and, and it is genuinely an impressive Bible. This is really a fun, unique Bible. Well, the king produces his own Bible. He bans the Geneva Bible and the pilgrims are going through persecution because also in England, the law was at that time from King Henry VIII, they, England changed from being Catholic to being Anglican. And there was a few doctrinal changes along the way, but they required that everybody in England has to go to the Anglican church. The pilgrims were not a fan of the Anglican church and they want to do something different. They suffered persecution. They finally realized we, we, we mean maybe just need to go somewhere else to enjoy freedom. So they go to Holland where in Holland, they were allowed a level of religious freedom. But while they're in Holland, they still have friends in England because their denomination was in England and their friends are being persecuted. And one of the things that happened under King uh, James in 1616, he passed a law that you were not allowed to print any religious material unless you had authorization and approval by the king. And so if you printed any religious material, you could be arrested, imprisoned, all kinds of stuff could happen. So they weren't allowed to 
print, any kind of commentaries, any kind of religious material. Well, in Holland, they, the pilgrims, they, they have their own printer. In fact, at one of the elders of the church, William Brewster, he was a printer. And so they begin printing things in Holland. Well, one of the things they printed in Holland, this is a very large book. This is the commentary of the New Testament that was printed in, in English in Holland. And then it was smuggled back to their friends in England, who at this point, they've had some of their religious things taken away from them. Well, when this is smuggled back to England, the king sees that there's these new books or he's hearing word. There's these new books and it's commentary. And as you can imagine, the commentary were saying things where the king was wrong. And so the king sends some soldiers, go find where this came from. And they do this investigation, these detectives at work, and they find, well, this is coming from Holland. They go to Holland and they find where this is being printed and it's done by the pilgrims. And the king has his guards tell them, hey, you cannot print and send any religious material back anymore. That's against the law. So they're put on, on warning that this can't happen again. The following year, this pamphlet was done. This pamphlet, there are five things that the king had approved as far as uh, practices of the church. And it included things like communion or baptism. And, and actually, in communion and baptism, if you paid special money, you could get a really good baptism. Or if you paid special <laughs> money, you could get good communion. But... Uh, Again, like th this is stuff that that's not what the I, I Bible want teaches. good baptism. That's what I, I want. Good <laughs> baptism. I want good communion. Can I have both? Right. So so in, in this, they go through and, and they go through five things that the king was promoting. And they say, guys, this is totally wrong. Well, they've already been put on warning that you're not supposed to print religious material and send it back to England. And so the king sends troops back and says, go find them and put a stop to this. Don't let them print anything ever again. So the troops come to Holland. They find the printer. And they go and they take all of his, his printing material. Now, they leave the big printing press, but they take all of his printing material. And so he has the press, but he doesn't have any typesetting material. So like the alphabet, all the things you use to print things are now gone. And the pilgrims are realizing that their life is not as comfortable as, as they had hoped it would be in Holland. They're, they're still dealing with religious persecution. They're still in reach of the king. And it occurs to them that there's a new world across an entire ocean. If they can go to the new world, then maybe they can have more religious freedom than they're enjoying in Holland. They, they can have their kids raised in a, a, in Holland, it was still a secular nation and they didn't want their kids raised being secular. That said, if we go to the new world, we can form our own community. We can raise our kids in godliness. We can have our religious freedom. And so they come up with this idea. They go back to England. They hire two ships, the Mayflower and the Speedwell, the Speedwell, uh, and, and they're supposed to leave in the summer. The Speedwell, they get off uh, out in the ocean. The Speedwell develops leaks. They have to go back. They repair the leaks. They try again. There's more leaks. They go back. And these delays, which also uh, historians are, are, are kind of in agreement that it looks like there was a level of sabotage that people in the Speedwell didn't really want to take the pilgrims to America. So they were creating their own holes in the ship. And anyway, they go back. The pilgrims say, okay, well, we can't all fit on one ship, so we're just going to send part of our, our congregation from our church. We're going to send them to the new world. And on this overcrowded ship, th there's a lot of miracles that occur along the way. But one of the bizarre things that happens is they decide to take the printing press. They, they have no printing material, so there's no way to print anything. And the printing press is huge. It's massive. They decide to take the printing press on this overcrowded ship with them. Well, it ends up being very providential they did because in the midst of the journey across the ocean, the main beam of the ship breaks. And when it breaks, it, it essentially cripples the ship. And, and they don't have the tools that the, the crew on the ship didn't have the tools they needed to repair it. And they said, well, we, right, we have to jack it back up in place and, and we have to secure it. And, and we don't have any kind of jack to do that. And the pilgrims are like, well, we have a press and there's a jack screw on it. We, we can help you. So the pilgrims literally brought with them the very tool necessary to repair the ship. They repair the ship, but there's, there's massive storms the whole way across. Well, providentially, again, these storms blow them north because the pilgrims had permission from the king to go to the Jamestown colony. So to go to Virginia. Well, the storm blew them north to Massachusetts. And in Massachusetts, there is no colony. So they arrive, they're, they're out of food. They arrive to a place where there are no homes. There is no shelter. There, there's no fuel for even fire. It's winter up in Massachusetts. So there's already snow on the ground. And they decide before we get off in Virginia, there's a government already in place. Well, there's no government here. And, and, there was more than just the church congregation because there was other people on the ship, other crew. And they said, we need to have some form of government. This is what led them to write the Mayflower Compact. And 
in the opening paragraph of the Mayflower Compact, they said that for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith, we mutually bind ourselves together in a holy covenant. And, it, and on it goes to talk about their form of government. But their opening paragraph says, for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith, that's why we're going to join together and make this government. Well, when they come on, on land, they, they are in a world where they don't know how to hunt in this world. They, they, they aren't even sure how to really fish where they are. And that winter, they're, they're really out of food. Half of them died that first winter. And when, as, as they're struggling to survive, they finally arrive in spring. When the spring, one of the first natives they encounter was an Indian named Somerset. And Somerset uh, had done some trading with English and with French uh, who had trade ships up and down the coast. And so he had learned a few English words. Well, when he speaks a few English words, the pilgrims are blown away. They can't believe someone actually spoke English. And he tells them he's going to go find somebody and bring them a friend who speaks even more English than he does. Well, he goes and brings back Squanto, which also he brings a whole delegation. Chief Massasoit, the chief of all the Wampanoag Indians come. And through Squanto translating, the pilgrims are able to explain that they were trying to go to Virginia, the storm blew them north, but now that they want to form a colony, can they buy land? And, and they begin working out with Chief Massasoit to buy the land. They make a peace treaty because they tell them, we don't want any trouble. We, we just want to worship God and, and, and we want to raise families in, in, in our religious practice. And the chief agrees. He said, hey, that's no problem. They have a agreement that it became the longest lasting peace treaty between any white people and any Native Americans in American history. And this peace treaty lasted. In fact, they became very good neighbors. Well, Squanto ends up living with the pilgrims. And had it not been for Squanto, the pilgrims probably wouldn't have survived. But Squanto shows them how to, how to plant and grow crops. He shows them actually where to hunt and where to fish. And the reason Squanto also is, is really important in this narrative and, and why this is a big deal. Today, a lot of people hear about Jamestown and, and, and 1619 and Jamestown. Jamestown's really bad and all this narrative we're today. Well, Jamestown had a lot of problems. That's absolutely true. Now, a lot of what's being said today about Jamestown is not the really entirely correct story of Jamestown. However, one of the things that, that did happen in Jamestown, they did have some, some very immoral people along the way. And one of the guys who was a ship captain came to Jamestown, but was sailing up the coast. His name was Thomas Hunt. And in 1614, Thomas Hunt invited 27 natives to come see a ship because they had never seen a boat that big and they wanted to come on board and he invited them on. He ends up kidnapping all 27 natives. And Thomas Hunt was an English captain, but he sailed to Spain. At that time, Spain was already very involved in the slave trade. So he took these 27 natives to Spain. He sells them into slavery. Well, in Spain, there were Spanish friars, uh, kind of like English monks, right? Guys who were Christians, who wanted to follow God. And these Spanish friars saw these Indians being sold into slavery and, and several already been sold, but they go and they buy it. Estimates are about 19 of them were how many slaves they bought. Well, one of the slaves they bought was Squanto. Squanto had been kidnapped in that original group. Squanto was taken over to Spain, sold into slavery. When Squanto got his freedom, he ends up getting to England. In England, he lives with a group of monks in England for five years. And for five years, they teach him English. They teach him the English custom and culture. Well, in 1619, Squanto gets on a ship. He makes it back to America. He gets dropped off. He goes back to find his home, to find his tribe, his people, his family, his wife. And when he gets back home, it literally was in Plymouth where the pilgrims were going. He gets back home in 1619 and a plague has killed his entire tribe. His family is gone. He's lost everything. And so he found a local tribe. He, 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 join the local tribe. But, but I mean, really his life has been devastated when the pilgrims arrive in 1620. It was almost as if Squanto had a new purpose and, and mission for life because Squanto went and lived with the pilgrims. And for two years, he lived with them, showing them how to survive. And so, so literally the very place he used to live, the pilgrims arrive, they don't know what to do. They don't know where, where to hunt and where to fish. And so Squanto's like, guys, let me show you the best fishing spot. If you come over here, we can fish right here. So Squanto is the guy who literally helps him know how to survive. He lived with him for two years. He ends up getting sick and he, he ends up dying. Governor Bradford in his journal has a, a really cool account that on Squanto's deathbed, he asked Governor Bradford to come pray for him. And he said, pray for me that, that when I die, I, I, I may go to, to the white man's heaven, to, to your heaven, and I may be with your God. I mean, just a really cool account that he had been so impacted by the pilgrims and, and arguably even by living with the English monks 
over in England before he comes back to America. But what's significant is when you come to the first Thanksgiving, at that first Thanksgiving, there's only 53 pilgrims that have survived to this point. And of those 53 pilgrims, there's only 22 adult, adult males. The rest are women and children. There's a few elderly people there as well. And Chief Massasoit was invited by the pilgrims to come. They, they want to have a feast because they want to thank God that now they have their own land and, and, and they're learning how to hunt and fish. And, and they've actually grown their own crops and, and they might actually survive this winter. They want to thank God for God's provision. And they invite their Indian friends to come. So Chief Massasoit came with 90 Indian braves. And this is also worth noting. One of the things in modern culture is there's a narrative that all land was stolen from Native Americans, that all white people treated natives really poorly. This is where even looking to pilgrims, you can dispel this narrative pretty quickly because there were only 22 adult males that were there that first Thanksgiving. There were 90 Indian braves. If these Indians felt like the pilgrims were really bad people, that they were cheating and stealing from them, that first Thanksgiving would have gone very differently, but it, it didn't go that way. In fact, the pilgrims and the Indians, they feasted together for three days. They, the Indians actually brought the majority of the food. They brought the deer and the lobster and the eel and so much that they enjoyed for those three days. And they had athletic competitions, they had, they had shooting competitions, and they had races. And for three days, they spent time together. But one of the pivotal, important moments was the pilgrims taking time to thank God for what God had done for them. And this really does matter, thinking about even the context, because for the pilgrims, half of their people had died that first winter. So, so for the people that first Thanksgiving, I mean, you have husbands who have lost their wives, right? You, you, you have parents who lost their kids or kids who lost their parents. Their lives were devastated that first winter, and yet they still are coming together because they recognize even in the midst of challenging and hard times, even in the midst of frustration, they can still thank God for God's provision that, that, that we know the Bible tells us Romans 8, 28, that God can cause all things to work together for good for those that love him and called according to his purpose. They're able to see that God is moving, even in the midst of what's been a very challenging time for them, that, that God is working on their behalf, that God has helped them have native allies and they have new friends and their friends are helping them learn to survive. It's an absolutely incredible story. And even along those lines, on the table in front of me, I have a lot of artifacts. This is actually a cup from Plymouth. So as we talk about the first Thanksgiving, uh, this very well could have been part of that first Thanksgiving. Uh, we have also, this is the pocket watch of Miles Stanish. She was the military commander of the Pilgrims. We also, this is a super cool piece. This is a mirror. And it, I know it's not a very good mirror compared to our standards, uh, but this was a mirror from all the way back then. This came to America as well with the Pilgrims. We have a lot of stuff from the Pilgrims, which is really fun for us being able to tell some of that story and some of the narrative. But the reality is it, the Pilgrims started a tradition for us in America that every single fall, we were going to, as a people, take time and, and remember God, remember what God had done for us, remember the blessings God had given us, even in the midst of challenging and hard times. And that tradition continued on. When, when, when you go to the time of the founding fathers, they, they would do prayer proclamation. So if there was a governor or even president or Congress, Continental Congress or state legislative bodies, they would call for official days of prayer and thanksgiving, and they would issue official prayer proclamations. By 1815, there had been more than 1,400 official prayer proclamations, so times when, when governors or when, when Congress or even presidents called for official days of prayer, over 1,400 of those, and that's by 1815. And, and this is one of the things I love to point to when people often say, well, America wasn't really religious. We didn't really have a Christian founding. I would like to ask, if they weren't really religious, then why did they have so many days of prayer? Because that's not the normal activity of atheists or agnostics or deists, but this was part of the tradition the pilgrims started. Thanksgiving wasn't just about having a feast. It was about taking time, enjoying time with friends and family. But in, in that moment of enjoying time with friends and family, it was about remembering who God was, what God had done, even in the midst of challenging, trying times. And, and I think this is so pertinent because as we look, you know, coming out of some of the COVID craziness and, and, and crisis and people lost loved ones and businesses were closed and, and, and people lost jobs, there was a lot of devastation. I mean, th this is really good perspective thinking, right, even for the pilgrims, that they lost so many of their loved ones, their friends and their family died that first year. They still recognize we still need to, to, to see that God is still doing things. There is still a good God who is still worthy of our praise, who still needs the acknowledgement from us. We recognize we're going to be thankful for what God has done, even in the midst of challenging and trying times. Thanksgiving is one of my favorite holidays. 
So I, we could talk about this, go any direction we want to, but that's kind of some of the background uh, of Thanksgiving and why it really is worth celebrating still today for us as Christians in America. Absolutely. Wow. What a story. <laughs> I hope that people love that. It has to be the case that people don't know a lot of that information. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, so because we are running out of time, I I want to ask you this. Um, is is What are you guys up to now? I know that you're starting some other new things. Do you want to say any of those things rather than I, keep on this trail before we have to jump off? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, totally we can. So uh, we, we, we do a lot with American history, but a lot of what we try to do also with stuff with public policy, um, trying to protect God given rights, uh, freedom for individuals. You know, one of the things you mentioned we can appreciate so much about America is we have religious freedom and we have religious liberty in America. But the reality is, it's because we recognize God given rights and everybody in the world has God given rights. If you live in China, you have God given rights, but, but they don't get to enjoy those in China. Why? because they're not politically protected in China. What, what's made America so different isn't that we have rights other people don't, it's that the rights that we have are politically protected in America. Everybody has the same set of God-given rights, but if they're not politically protected, you can't enjoy them to the same level and extent. And so a lot of what we try to do is help protect legislatively those God-given rights so people will always in America have the freedom to worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. Uh, we have a lot of writing projects and initiatives trying to go back and tell some of these stories. We have a book uh, my dad and I put out just a year or two ago called The American Story, where we actually start with Christopher Columbus. We go through the ending of slavery in America I don't know if you remember when I was growing up, my my favorite radio uh, program was Paul Harvey uh, called The Rest of the Story. And I love Paul Harvey, where he right. would give you a, a little bit of a story at the beginning. He would tease it and he would say, and now the rest of the story. And, and then he would give you more details and context where you go, this is an incredible story. We didn't know that. That's the way we we tried to write this book, The American Story, is it's not dodging the fact that, right, we are starting place with history, with people is in Romans 3.23, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Our starting place is that everybody's a sinner who needs a savior. So when we look at Columbus, we're not saying this guy was perfect. We recognize he's a sinner who needs a savior. But when you learn the story of Columbus, it's a lot different than what a lot of us know today. The same thing with the pilgrims or with Squanto. There's so much more to the story that we try to tell more of the story. So we have a lot of writing projects and initiatives going on. Uh, we do a lot of training throughout the year. We do work with pastors. We do work with teachers. We do work with legislators, with, with young people with students. So there's a lot of initiatives we have. And a lot of those people can find on our website, wallbuilders.com. Wallbuilders.com. I like it. Um, man, I, I, I learned so much. I, I don't know tons of that stuff. And uh, I mean, I, I've, I've been reading here and there lots of different pieces, but you know, I think one of my favorite things is, is the more I, I find out about the various, as you said, the, the prayers um, of, and the, the, these assemblies would be led with or as they would dedicate a, a, a you know dedicate the city or dedicate somebody coming into office it was all um a presupposition that yeah. they're praying to god it's a presupposition that they're there because of god and it, it's funny that some of these things in america now um but but we don't know why I mean, even I mean, we were talking to somebody recently because they were really upset about the idea that this country was you know founded on christian principles and i was like I was like yeah if you go into court and you're sworn into court what do you put your hand on you know you put your hand on a bible right he's like well yeah i'm like well why <laughs> there's some sort of presupposition here and you can see those things in history i, th I think they're absolutely fascinating so i hope people Love that as much as I do. And I hope it encourages people to, to be thankful to the Lord Jesus Christ, as always, this week. But to not be ashamed to say, hey, I'm thankful to live in a country where our rights are protected by the government, as you just said. Not given by the government, protected by the government. I, I don't know why. It's just crazy that even Christians have gotten to a place where they think that that's somehow pious to 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 dislike America or something, you just realize that this the arguments from secularists are really not working. So the book is called what? The American Story. Yes, the American Story. And there was also a um, there's also a video on on Epic Times. Is that right? That you guys did as well? Yeah, we we did a, a six part series. Um, kind of really quick history, Columbus up to. Uh, pre-revolution stages, kind of the road to the revolution, but just giving an overall view 
uh, as I kind of already highlighted today, we have a lot of artifacts and documents. And so everything we do, we can show the original documents. And when we say somebody said something, we can say it was actually right here in this writing, in this letter, in this book. So one of the things we encourage people, like even the story today, don't take my word for this. You can go look it up for yourself. And, and that's really important because, I, you know, John, I think one of the reasons we've gotten in so much trouble in our culture and in modern culture, in our nation is we've just trusted the wrong people for way too long and, and kind of gullibly just believed what they said. When the reality is, you know, Acts 17, one of the best examples, when the apostle Paul was talking to the Bereans and, and the Bereans wouldn't trust anything Paul said until they had gone and looked it up in the scrolls, right? And, and so Paul's saying, well, hey guys, we know Isaiah prophesied about Jesus. And they're like, wait a second, somebody get the scroll of Isaiah. And they would get it out and look and be like, oh, that is what he said. Okay, Paul, you may continue. But Paul actually praises them saying, guys, you guys are amazing. No one will ever mislead you because you are pursuers of truth and you make sure you find truth before you believe it. This is one of the things that we have to restore in our own lives and in the Christian community. We can't just believe what somebody says. We need to be pursuers of truth, knowing that Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life. In John 8, 32, he said we would know the truth, and the truth would set us free. Uh, even Philippians 4, 8, whatever is true, think about these things. We need to be more conscious about truth, and truth is not insecure. Truth does not mind being fact-checked because if you go look it up, you in fact will discover truth. And I, I love that so many of the great Christian apologists in the last century, whether it be a C.S. Lewis or a Josh McDowell, some of these incredible minds, they were literally skeptics who wanted to question Christianity, but in their questioning, they found the truth. I would encourage people, any part of our conversation, don't take my word for it. Go back question with boldness go back and look for truth but if you look for truth with confidence i can tell you what you will find so don't don't buy into what somebody says just because they say it be pursuers of truth oh absolutely amen i love it super great having you on the show good to uh, quote meet you for the first time today i hope people like it i hope you guys have an awesome thanksgiving read the bible Yeah.